Fact, the Civil War was not for or against slavery. If you're not already aware of this, then you've been successfully duped by those who have rewritten history to advance their agenda to divide and control the land of the free. If you are already aware that the war was not fought over slavery, then it still bears repeating given the current Black Lives Matter operation and the associated operation to take down all Confederate statues as well as ban anything that sports the Confederate flag. Those who control these untied states are showing little to no resistance to this erasing of history because it serves their ongoing operation to channel public anger and actions away from the economic destruction and collapse that has been deliberately planned and executed by these parasites. At this point, they are using every cover possible to pit all against all, black against white, women against men, young against old, north against south, Americans against Chinese, Iranians, Russians, and any other group they can dupe the public into hating. Rewriting the history of the Civil War has been a long-standing cover for the advancement of the ever-increasing dominance and power of the federal government. So this operation gets consistently reinforced in the public consciousness. Hammering it as part of the Black Lives Matter operation is just the latest iteration to keep the sheep in line. Let's listen to some discussion about this operation from various folks. One of the great myths in American history is about the Civil War, where it's commonly taught that the Civil War was fought to end slavery. But historians have rewritten history for the purpose of telling a more satisfying narrative because it's the only way to justify what was a totally illegal war. A Prager University video with over a million views is a perfect example of the lies told about the Civil War, and we'll go through the video and explain some of the lies that are told. Before the presidential election of 1860, a South Carolina newspaper warned that the issue before the country was the extinction of slavery and called on all who were not prepared to surrender the institution to act. Shortly after Abraham Lincoln's victory, they did. Well, if you want to play the quote game, we can play it. In Lincoln's first inaugural address, he said, quote, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. In Lincoln's letter to Horace Greeley in 1862, a year after the Civil War had already started, he writes, If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union, without freeing any slave, I would do it. But in the video, they quote the Charleston Mercury, and the same newspaper, the Charleston Mercury, said two days before Lincoln's election in November of 1860, summing up the reasons why South Carolina should secede, they wrote, quote, the real causes of dissatisfaction in the South with the North are in the unjust taxation and expenditure of the taxes by the government of the United States and in the revolution the North has effected in this government from a confederated republic to a national sectional despotism. Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, said, quote, the North was mad and blind. It would not let us govern ourselves. And so the war came, and now it must go on till the last man of this generation falls in his tracks and his children seize the musket and fight our battle unless you acknowledge our right to self-government. We are not fighting for slavery. We are fighting for independence and that or extermination. There are many more quotes just like this that indicate the Civil War was not about slavery. So there are quotes on both sides of the argument, and there always will be. You're going to find quotes that say Obama was a great president and other quotes that say Obama was a horrible president. Instead of just taking the quotes at face value and swallowing them whole, one should actually look at the evidence to determine if the quotes are truthful or not. Charles and Mary Beard wrote the first scholarly in-depth economic study of the war and came to this conclusion, since therefore the abolition of slavery never appeared in the platform of any great political party, since the only appeal ever made to the electorate on that issue was scornfully repulsed, since the spokesman of the Republicans emphatically declared that his party never intended to interfere with slavery in any shape or form, it seems reasonable to assume that the institution of slavery was not a fundamental issue during the epoch preceding the bombardment of Fort Sumter. But the author goes on to quote Alexander Stevens. Alexander Stevens of Georgia, the Confederacy's vice president, clearly articulated the views of the South in March 1861. Our new government, he said, was founded on slavery. Its foundations are laid 
Its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, submission to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. Okay, well, what did Abraham Lincoln think of blacks? Let's take him at his own words in his speech on September 18, 1858, where he says, quote, I will say then that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. While they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and as much as any other man am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. This is what Abraham Lincoln thinks of black people. Does this sound like a guy ready to send hundreds of thousands of people to die to give them a better life? After all, slavery was legal in Union states like Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky during the Civil War. But the video goes on. Yet despite the evidence, many continue to argue that other factors superseded slavery as the cause of the Civil War. Some argue that the South only wanted to protect states' rights. But this raises an obvious question. The states' rights to what? Wasn't it to maintain and spread slavery? States' rights to govern themselves. It's really simple. States' rights to govern themselves. Just as America wanted the ability to govern itself based on its own interests, states wanted the right to govern themselves on their interests, which meant free trade without tariffs to fatten the pockets of the North. But it's also important to know that not all the Confederate states seceded at the same time. Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Arkansas did not originally secede. But after Fort Sumter, a battle that caused zero human casualties, Lincoln called for 75,000 troops, ordered a naval blockade, which is an act of war that required congressional approval, which Lincoln didn't care to wait for, ordered the building of five naval warships, suspended habeas corpus so he could use it to throw over 10,000 people in jail, and Lincoln also shut down over 300 newspapers in the North who expressed any dissent about the war. Where was the constitutional authority for such unthinkable actions? There wasn't any. But after Lincoln took these illegal actions to reinforce Fort Sumter and the moral tariff duties increased in March, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Arkansas seceded and joined the Confederacy. It was Lincoln's tyrannical response to the secession of the first southern states that prompted the other states to join, but the video continues. Moreover, states' rights was not an exclusive southern issue. All the states, north and south, sought to protect their rights. Sometimes they petitioned the federal government. Sometimes they quarreled with each other. This is true, because a number of other states in the North had threatened to secede from the Union before. Massachusetts did so four times. The Massachusetts legislature actually passed a resolution of secession, and Thomas Jefferson wished them luck. After the Louisiana Purchase, when there was talk of dividing the Union into an Atlantic Federation and a Mississippi Federation, Thomas Jefferson said, quote, Let them part by all means, if it is for their happiness to do so. It is but the elder and younger son differing. In fact, the Founding Fathers thought secession was a right that states should be able to do. As James Madison wrote, the use of force against a state would be more like a declaration of war than an infliction of punishment and would probably be considered by the party attacked as a dissolution of all previous compacts. Alexander Hamilton wrote, to coerce a state would be one of the maddest projects ever devised. No state would ever suffer itself to be used as the instrument of coercing another. But the video continues. Some argue that the cause of the war was economic. The North was industrial and the South agrarian. And so, the two lived in such economically different societies that they could no longer stay together. Not true. In the middle of the 19th century, both North and South were agrarian societies. In fact, the North produced far more food crops than did the South. But Northern farmers had to pay their farmhands, who were free to come and go as they pleased while southern plantation owners exploited slaves over whom they had total control. Okay, so this is a purposefully misleading clip. When some argue that the North and South were extremely different and that one side making all the laws that benefit them but are detrimental to the South caused the Civil War, he counters it by arguing that the North was also an agricultural economy, so there wasn't much difference. Look, the North even grew more food, see? Yeah, the North grew more food because the South's biggest crops were cotton and tobacco, neither of which are food. They are cash crops, and they were some of the top exports that America had. 
The North was fine with slavery as long as they benefited from the cash that cotton and tobacco brought in, but as soon as their cash cow seceded, they started a war to get it back, and used slavery as the moral justification for it. The South was fundamentally different because its greatest assets were the largest exports in the country. As North Carolina historian Mike Scruggs writes, considerably more than 90% of U.S. government revenue was raised by a tariff on imported goods. A tariff is a tax on selected imports, most commonly finished or manufactured products. A high tariff is usually legislated not only to raise revenue, but also to protect domestic industry from foreign competition. This, of course, causes domestic consumers to pay higher prices and have a lower standard of living. Tariffs on some industrial products also hurt other domestic industries that must pay higher prices for goods they need to make their products. Because the nature and products of regional economies can vary widely, high tariffs are sometimes good for one section of the country, but damaging to another section of the country. High tariffs are particularly hard on exporters since they must cope with higher domestic costs and retaliatory foreign tariffs that put them at a pricing disadvantage. This has a depressing effect on both export volume and profit margins, High tariffs have been a frequent cause of economic disruption, strife, and war. But the video continues. And it wasn't just plantation owners who supported slavery. The slave society was embraced by all classes in the South. The rich had multiple motivations for wanting to maintain slavery. But so did the poor, non-slaveholding whites. The peculiar institution ensured that they did not fall to the bottom rung of the social ladder. That's why another argument that the Civil War couldn't have been about slavery because so few people owned slaves has little merit. His reasoning is that it guaranteed poor whites weren't the lowest class, and this is asinine. The reason that Southerners fought for the Confederacy and didn't own any slaves is because the war wasn't about slavery. Non-slave-owning Confederates were fighting to defend themselves against a foreign invader. The Confederacy had made its own country and the North invaded it. This can be clearly seen when Robert E. Lee, who was offered the Supreme Commander position for the Union, Lee, who was a big fan of the Union and disagreed with Southern secession and was openly against slavery, ended up choosing to lead the Confederate Army because the Confederacy was not the aggressor, the Union was. The South was defending itself, and even though he liked the Union and disagreed with the war, he was a native of Virginian, and he decided that the Union attacking his homeland was wrong. It shouldn't be hard to see. If a woman wanted to break up with her husband, would the husband attacking her with a gun and demanding them stay together be an appropriate response? In the American Revolution, the colonies seceded from British rule. Britain sent troops to attack America and the colonies defended its turf, which is exactly what happened in the Civil War. The South seceded from Union rule, the Union attacked them, and the South defended its turf. As the British press began to ask themselves, how could a nation which professed such a strong belief in government by the people turn on its own citizens and deny them what it supposedly stood for? With what pretense of fairness it is said, can you Americans object to the secession of the southern states when your nation was founded on secession from the British Empire? But the video continues. Finally, many have argued that President Abraham Lincoln fought the war to keep the Union together, not to end slavery. That was true at the outset of the war, but he did so with the clear knowledge that keeping the Union together meant either spreading slavery to all the states, an unacceptable solution, or vanquishing it altogether. Okay, this is my favorite statement of the video because he debunks his own video with this statement. Many have argued that President Abraham Lincoln fought the war to keep the Union together, not to end slavery. That was true at the outset of the war. That was true at the outset of the war. That was true at the outset of the war. He says it point blank right there that at the outset of the war, Lincoln was not fighting to end slavery. So yes, the Civil War was not about slavery. But what he says afterwards is just idiotic. But he did so with the clear knowledge that keeping the Union together meant either spreading slavery to all the states, an unacceptable solution, or vanquishing it altogether. He claims that Lincoln knew that if slavery were allowed to continue in the South, all the states would become either free states or slave states. There's no evidence to support this claim whatsoever. Northern states were not under pressure to become slave states. This is a flat-out lie. In fact, prior to the Civil War from 1846 to 1861, six states were admitted to the Union, Iowa, Wisconsin, Oregon, California, Minnesota, and Kansas, all of which were free states. The fact that the newest states were being made free states should be an obvious indication that northern states were not under threat of becoming slave states as this guy claims. He's lying. But the video continues. In a famous campaign speech in 1858, Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. What was it that divided the country? It was slavery and only slavery. He continued, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave 
and half free. It will become all one thing or all the other. Lincoln's view never changed, and as the war progressed, the moral component, ending slavery, became more and more fixed in his mind. Okay, so he quotes Lincoln when he said, the United States will become all one thing or all the other. Yes, Lincoln believed eventually it will become all free. That's because slavery was already dying out. Europe had already freed slaves. Countries in the Caribbean like Haiti had already freed the slaves. The newest states admitted to the Union had been made free states. The slave trade was already abolished by Thomas Jefferson 60 years before Lincoln even made the statement. So yes, slavery was dying and it was only a matter of time before they would be free. But then he goes on to say that the moral component ending slavery became more and more fixed in Lincoln's mind. He says this because for the entire first half of the Civil War, nobody was talking about slavery. The moral component became more important as the war dragged on because the Civil War was illegal. As a popular British publication wrote, there is no congressional authority, whatever, for what has been done. It has been done simply on Mr. Lincoln's fiat, at his simple bidding, acting by no authority but his own pleasure. In plain defiance of the provisions of the Constitution, the Habeas Corpus Act has been suspended, the press muzzled, and judges prevented by armed men from enforcing on the citizens' behalf the laws to which which they and the president alike have sworn. Lincoln abused his powers to start the war, delayed the meeting of Congress for three months so he can get into a war before Congress could do anything about it, then suspended the rights of habeas corpus, and by doing this he was able to throw over 10,000 people in jail for expressing any dissent, like Clement Vallingham in 1863. Lincoln excused his apparently unconstitutional arrest on the grounds that public safety made the arrest not only necessary, but legal. As long as public safety was endangered, the arrests were constitutional. But of course the Constitution makes no such claim. What what did Vallingham do? He called the war wicked and cruel and called Lincoln King Lincoln and charged that Lincoln's tax law was the like of which has never been seen upon any but a conquered people. Case ex parte Milligan, a man named Milligan's treasonable conduct was tried and the jury found insufficient evidence to convict or indict him. A military court then took over, convicted him and sentenced him to death. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger B. Taney, had ruled that his arrest was illegal and Lincoln did not have the authority to suspend habeas corpus without congressional approval. Lincoln not only disregarded the ruling, he was so outraged he issued an arrest warrant for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court because he disagreed with his ruling. Later, however, President Andrew Johnson restored habeas corpus so it could be brought before the Supreme Court, who released Milligan and condemned the past five years of phony military arrests, and this was illegal. This is why the moral component of the Civil War became louder as the war went on, because as the war was going on, Europe was looking at America and asking themselves, should we help the Confederacy? But John Stuart Mill came to Lincoln's rescue after he, a European would first concoct the idea that the Civil War was about slavery. And when Lincoln became aware that he could kill two birds with one stone, not only keeping Europe out of aiding the Confederacy, but also giving much needed moral justification for the Civil War because only a supreme moral reason could justify all the illegal activities he has engaged in. After all, Lincoln said, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of a official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Here Lincoln says clearly that the Civil War is not about freeing slaves, it's about keeping the Union together at all costs. Although his personal wish is that slavery end, that's not why he's fighting this war. He will keep slavery if it means keeping the Union together. But as Lincoln continued to break the law and hundreds of thousands of people were dying to protect northern economic and territorial interests, Lincoln needed a moral justification for all this wrongdoing. That's why the moral component of slavery became louder during the Civil War, not because, as this author says, that it just became more and more fixed in his mind. But the video continues. And as the war progressed, the moral component, ending slavery, became more and more fixed in his mind. His Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 turned that into law. This is another lie. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't end slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation did absolutely nothing in any legal sense. The Emancipation Proclamation only freed slaves in southern territories, which the Union didn't even control. It did nothing, which is why when Union General Fremont emancipated the slaves in his military district in Missouri, Lincoln promptly dismissed Fremont, rescinded his emancipation order, and sent the slaves back to their masters. Lincoln said of the incident, quote, It was a war for the great national idea, the Union, and General Fremont. 
Fremont should not have dragged the Negro into it. Fighting Joe Hooker wrote in response to the Emancipation Proclamation, a large element of the army had taken sides against it, declaring that they would never have embarked in the war had they anticipated this action of the government. Another Union officer, a colonel, wrote, Let it be understood that if this is a war for emancipation of the Negro, instead of a war in defense of the Constitution, three-quarters of the army would lay down their arms. Lincoln said in, in his emancipation, quote, testing whether the nation can long endure. That comment seems to presuppose that the South was out to conquer the North, which is just as absurd as saying that the revolting colonies in 1776 were out to destroy Great Britain. The Chicago Times wrote, if there was ever a non-sequitur in the annals of human warfare, that was it. All the South wanted was to withdraw from the Union and be left alone. How could that threaten the political institutions of the North or the right of free government? Lincoln also said in his proclamation, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Why didn't Lincoln even suggest that secession by southern states would mean that democracy would perish from the earth? H. L. Mencken wrote about the Emancipation Proclamation, quote, but let us not forget that it is poetry, not logic. Beauty, not sense. Think of the argument in it. Put it into cold words every day. The doctrine is simply this, that the Union soldiers who died at Gettysburg sacrificed their lives to the cause of self-determination. That government of the people, by the people, for the people, should not perish from the earth. It is difficult to imagine anything more un true. The Union soldiers in the battle actually fought against self-determination. It was the Confederates who fought for the right of their people to govern themselves. Even abolitionists saw the Emancipation Proclamation as a fraud, as it only applied to the territory over which the North had no control. It was thus an illusion. The North didn't care about minorities of color at all, whether black or Indian or of any color. Union General Sherman expressed his views about Indians after the Civil War in a letter to President Grant, writing, quote, we must act with vindictive earnestness against the Sioux, even to their extreme termination. Men, women, and children, nothing else will reach the root of this case. Sherman was to call the massacre of all American Indians his final solution to the Indian problem. Before Sherman died in 1891, he complained bitterly about civilian interference in his Indian policies, which had prevented him from, quote, getting rid of them all. But the video continues. Slavery is the great shame of America's history. No one denies that. But it's to America's everlasting credit that it fought the most devastating war in its history in order to abolish slavery. As a soldier, I am proud that the United States Army, my army, defeated the Confederates. In its finest hour, soldiers wearing this blue uniform. So here you can see the motivation for the belief in the war being to free the slaves. He mentions earlier in the video that Southerners searched for a different reason for the war to absolve themselves of defending the repugnant system. In reality, the narrative that the Civil War was about slavery stands because the victors get to write the history of the war, and fighting a war to free slavery is something to be proud of, certainly much more prideful than fighting an illegal war for economic and territorial interests. The idea that the Civil War was for slavery is a fable told to justify an otherwise illegal war that 660,000 Americans lost their lives in, and it was illegal. After the Civil War, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, was captured and arrested. It was going to be the trial of the century, and Northerners salivated waiting to get the chance to see this traitor hanged in public. However, when the smoke of the war cleared and emotions calmed down, upon examining the case of the South, it became overwhelmingly clear that the Confederacy actually had a really good case for the legality of secession. The Union chose as their leading trial prosecutor, John J. Clifford, but after reviewing the case, Clifford withdrew, arguing that he had grave doubts about the case and that the government could end up having fought a successful war only to have it declared unlawful. A year passed after Clifford withdrew and famous author and lawyer Richard Dana of Boston, who wrote the great novel Two Years Before the Mass, was chosen to lead the prosecution of Jefferson Davis. But he too declined the case after deciding that it was a loser and wrote a lengthy brief given to the president taking Clifford's position that they were going to lose this trial. The North was desperately trying to find a way to get out of taking Jefferson Davis to trial because they know, along with Jefferson Davis's lawyers that if this goes to trial and Jefferson Davis is ruled innocent, it would mean a war that cost the lives of 660,000 Americans was illegal and it would have been a PR nightmare that has never been seen. So President Johnson, who took over after Lincoln's assassination, offered Jefferson Davis a pardon. Jefferson Davis declined, saying signing a pardon would be agreeing that he committed a crime and he believed he did no such thing. Yes, Jefferson Davis wanted his day in court because he knew he would be ruled innocent. Davis was in prison for a year before making bond 
found provided by abolitionist Horace Greeley. After two years had passed since this arrest, only the Attorney General's office could try the case, and as other lawyers declined, they came up with an amazing solution to avoid trial. The 14th Amendment had been adopted, which provided that anyone who had engaged in insurrection against the United States and had at one time taken an oath of allegiance, which Jefferson Davis had done as a U.S. Senator, could not hold public office. The Bill of Rights prevents double jeopardy, and thus Davis, who had already been punished once by the 14th Amendment and not being permitted to hold public office, couldn't be tried and punished again for treason. This loophole enabled the North to avoid a trial that would have officially ruled the Civil War illegal. The Civil War was not about slavery. It's really obvious when actually looking at the facts. It's easy to see how this could come about because the side effect of the Civil War was that it did bring about the end of slavery. So the natural assumption is that this was the goal, but it wasn't. The side effect of a certain decision is not indicative of the intentions that influenced the original decision. For example, Lance Armstrong took performance enhancing drugs, won a bunch of races, became world famous and raised millions of dollars for cancer research, which is a noble thing. But that's not why Lance Armstrong took performance enhancing drugs. He took them to get a competitive advantage and win. Just because his drug usage had a very positive side effect of raising money for cancer does not mean his motivation for taking the drugs in the first place was the positive outcome that resulted. Similarly, the Civil War and the Union's victory had a wonderful result of abolishing slavery, but that was not the motivation for the war itself. The reality is, when Lincoln increased the moral tariff to 50% shortly after his election and the Confederacy opened a free trade port in the South, the northern economy was under serious threat. The South could buy textiles from European countries at a cheaper price without tariffs, making the manufacturing economy in the North obsolete. And this was not something that Lincoln was willing to accept, so he fought it, and that's how the Civil War actually happened. Some will argue things like, yes, the South seceded for their rights, but primarily for their rights to own slaves. This is a stupid argument, because slavery slavery was already legal in the Union during the Civil War. In Union states like Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland, slavery was legal during the Civil War, so that would not be a reason to secede over. Lincoln already offered protection of slavery in his inauguration and said during the war that he would keep slavery if it meant keeping the Union. Slavery was not under threat of abolition at the time of secession. There were no proposals, initiatives, or rumors of upcoming proposals or initiatives that would threaten slavery from the North, so seceding over that is nonsense. Some will object to this by saying the South didn't secede over the tariffs because the tariff was only 20% at the time South Carolina seceded. It's true that the moral tariff didn't go up to 50% until after many of the Confederate states seceded, and that when the initial secession occurred, the tariff was only 20%. But this objection assumes that wealthy business owners who are lobbying politicians are completely ignorant of potential legislative changes that may affect their businesses, but that assumption is wrong. For example, even in present day, Walmart was to open several locations among the Washington, D.C. area. Then the $15 minimum wage discussion started to become popular. Even though D.C. had not yet implemented or passed legislation to implement a $50 minimum wage, Walmart realized what was on the horizon for D.C. and canceled their plans to open new locations in Washington, D.C. To say the South didn't secede because of the tariff is like saying Walmart didn't cancel plans to open locations in D.C. because of the $15 minimum wage. Even though it wasn't an official law yet, they could see the writing on the wall and pull out a building in D.C. because of it. And sure enough, they were right. The $15 minimum wage would end up passing and being implemented into law. Just like Walmart, importers and exporters in the South knew full well that once Lincoln was elected, tariffs would increase, and two months after Lincoln stepped into office, they were right, and the tariff went to 50%. Here's a few honest questions to ask yourself when considering whether the Civil War was actually about slavery or not. Was there any legislative proposal whatsoever to end slavery prior to the Civil War? If the North so badly wanted to end slavery, wouldn't a diplomatic attempt be the first course? Wouldn't the North try to negotiate for the abolition of slavery and offer concessions to make it happen before war? Why would the first proposed legislation to end slavery come after 600,000 people died in a war over it? And why would it not apply to freeing slaves in the North? If this was a noble war over over slavery, why did Lincoln shut down over 300 newspapers? What was he afraid that they were going to say? Why did Lincoln send 75,000 men in arms and order a naval blockade over a battle that cost zero human lives? Isn't that a little extreme? Why would states secede over slavery when Lincoln in his inaugural address only emphasized the protection of it? How come after the slaves were freed, there was no plan whatsoever to integrate them? Is it because abolition of slavery wasn't something they planned for, but were being opportunist and jumped on as justification for a long list of illegal activity and didn't really think it out? Why would Lincoln start the most bloody war in American history for a group of people he believed to be so inferior? None of it makes sense. At least, if the Civil War was about slavery, it doesn't make sense. The Civil War was not about slavery. The war was not over slavery. It was not an issue. 
Let me prove to you just by two simple statements. I'll give you more. But let me prove to you that the war was not fought over slavery. And therefore, this flag could never, ever have represented slavery. You see, Abraham Lincoln proposed a 13th Amendment to the Constitution. He proposed that 13th Amendment in March of 1861. Here was Abraham Lincoln's proposed 13th Amendment. Quote, No amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service by the laws of said state, end quote. Did you hear that? Lincoln's proposed 13th Amendment said Congress shall not have the power to interfere with any institutions within any state, including those held to labor or service by the laws of that state. In other words, what Abraham Lincoln was saying to the South, if you will accept this proposed 13th Amendment, you may forever keep slaves. Folks, Beauregard never fired on Fort Sumter until April the 9th. This was in March of 1861. If the war had been about slavery, and if the South wanted just to keep slaves, and that was it, why fire a gun? Why fire a shot? Just simply accept this proposed 13th Amendment and it would all be over. Let me read to you. This resolution was passed unanimously by Congress on July the 23rd, 1861. You may read it for yourself in the congressional record. Here's what this resolution says. The war is waged by the government of the United States, not in the spirit of conquest or subjection, nor for the purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or institutions of the states, but to defend and protect the Union. Congress said, the war's not about slavery. Lincoln said, the war's not about slavery. I will even give you a 13th Amendment that will allow you to make slavery permanent. You see, what was happening was this. There's a lot of issues. But one of the issues was an economic issue. Do you realize the South, before the war, was extremely wealthy? And the South, before the war, funded probably 75 to 80 percent of all the taxes. But the, but the North wanted a 40 percent tariff. The South said no. The most we will ever agree to is a 10 percent tariff. And what Lincoln and the radical Republicans were doing was this. They were saying, we will give you the 13th Amendment. We will let you keep your slaves if that's what you want. You just let us keep our tariffs. In other words, the North was willing to sell the blacks out for money, for higher taxes. They weren't interested in the slaves. They could care less. You see... Hapgood's book, Abraham Lincoln, The Man of the People, on page 273, quotes Abraham Lincoln as saying, if I could save the Union without freeing any of the slaves, I would do it. Abraham Lincoln later said that slaves are property, and if freed, they should be paid for. Later on, Lincoln said, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Now here Lincoln is acknowledging that he has no lawful right to interfere with slavery. Slavery, by the way, was constitutional. All 13 colonies agreed on it. And by the way, in 1776, all 13 colonies held slaves. Not just the South, all of them. Lincoln said, I have no lawful right to interfere, nor, he says, do I have an inclination to do so. In a letter to Alexander Stevens, who happened to be later the vice president of the Confederacy, Lincoln wrote Alexander Hamilton Stevens and says this, Do the people of the South really entertain fear that a Republican administration would directly or indirectly interfere with their slaves, or with them about their slaves? If they do, I wish to assure you that once as a friend, and still I hope not an enemy, that there is no cause for such fears. The South would be in no more danger in this respect than it was in the days of Washington. So once again, Lincoln is saying, it's not over slavery. You say, but Brother Weaver, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves. No, it didn't. The Emancipation Proclamation did not 
free one slave. Do you know what Abraham Lincoln tried to do with the Emancipation Proclamation? In fact, he says so himself. And so does other men in his cabinet. They say that the Emancipation Proclamation was a war measure. Lincoln, number one, wanted to keep England specifically and the rest of Europe particularly from joining in with or recognizing the Confederate States of America. That was his first goal in that Emancipation Proclamation. His second goal was a war measure, another war measure, in the sense he was hoping that the blacks in the South would rise up in rebellion against their white masters and their white people. Let me tell you something. Just to show you there was no trouble in the South, there was not one rebellion during that war of black folks. Do you realize a thousand torches in a thousand black hands would have emptied the Confederate armies because the men would have gone home to protect their families. And Lincoln knew that. You see, what Lincoln did was this. Now listen to me. Lincoln tried to free the slaves in the South where he had absolutely no authority and he refused to release the slaves in the North where he did have authority. Did you know that in the northern armies, even when they were fighting the South, there were slaveholders in the northern armies? Did you know that General Robert E. Lee, when he inherited some slaves, freed them? General Ulysses S. Grant, who was the main general of the North and afterwards became president, even after the war was over, he kept his slaves. And he did so with this excuse. Good help is hard to find. You see, the truth of the matter is this. The Emancipation Proclamation was not only unconstitutional, and everybody recognized it, it cost the Republicans a lot of elections. There were five northern states that refused after that to elect Republicans to Congress. And moreover, there were a lot of Union soldiers that deserted because of it and refused to fight. Slavery was not the issue. So we have all these ignorant people, both black and white, condemning the South and tearing down monuments to brave Southerners who took a stand for freedom, fighting against unjust tax theft by the federal government. And millions more have been conditioned by their controllers to support these actions without bothering to investigate the real history behind the Confederacy and the war that resulted from the extortion of the Southern states by the federal government, not a war fought for or about slavery. It's time for the masses to wake up.